The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening. You are listening to a webinar on psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, also known as PNES. Let me introduce myself. I am Lorna Myers, a PhD. I am a clinical psychologist who has been uh, working for over 10 years with patients who have PNES. And I am also a neuropsychologist. I work at our clinical offices at the Northeast Regional Epilepsy Group, seeing patients. I am also a researcher and a consultant to psychologists around the country. I'm the director of clinical neuropsychology and the director of the PNES treatment program at Northeast Regional Epilepsy Group. So the purpose of this webinar is to educate uh, patients and family and loved ones about PNES. We will go over what we know about PNES and its characteristics, how it's diagnosed, treatment, and future educational research direction. And our goal is to provide reliable information about PNES to an audience uh, nationally, and uh, we have had uh, a number of uh, registrants uh, from other continents uh, on this evening, which was a uh, pleasant surprise to us. Let's start by talking about the challenges, and there are a number of challenges with PNES, but one of the particular ones is that PNES overlaps two different specialties both neurology and psychology, psychiatry. And because of this, it falls between the cracks. The question is, is it a neurological problem or a mental health problem? And because of this, a ping pong effect is created. From a neurological perspective, PNES falls outside the scope of practice of neurology because it is psychological. This is somewhat surprising because inpatient epilepsy monitoring centers throughout the U.S. evaluate and diagnose up to 20 to 30 percent of their inpatients with PNES. Despite this, most centers do not have a PNES treatment program. So clearly, this is a patient population that uh, is seen uh, quite frequently by specialty epilepsy programs. Uh, what is more disturbing is that often patients diagnosed with PNES are uh, discharged without a mental health referral. And this uh, runs counter to the national Association of Epilepsy Centers guidelines for essential services, uh, which state that level three and level four epilepsy centers must establish referral arrangements for comprehensive management of PNES. From a psychological and psychiatric perspective, there is also a challenge with PNES. Uh, Dr. Salim Benbadis, uh, a very um, productive researcher, clinician, and PNES advocate, recently wrote an editorial article in the Neuropsychiatry Journal in which he called out both APAs, the American Psychological and the American Psychiatric uh, Association, for not providing information about PNES, conversion disorders, on their website. And if you're interested in that article, uh, there is a link listed here uh, where you can find it. 
And he noted that the APA Psychiatric, in fact, offers 28 brochures, yet none of these mention somatoform, somatization, conversion, or factitious disorder. So there is essentially a lot of information on their website, but none of it uh, refers to uh, this particular disorder. And the APA Psychological provides information on a total of 56 psychological topics on their website with no mention of somatoform, somatization, conversion, or factitious disorders. So although PNES uh, is clearly within the psychological realm, uh, both of these major associations that have to do with uh, clinicians and researchers in the US um, have not yet included this uh, in their education for uh, the public or in their education for professionals. Moreover, one of the issues is that many therapists think that PNES is somehow outside their scope of practice because it is, quotation marks, neuro, so it's neurological in some sense. So when an episode occurs in the office, the diagnosis is questioned and the patient is often sent back to neurology. So this is really what uh, develops the ping pong effect of uh, a patient going from neurology to psychiatry or psychology and back to neurology and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about what are epileptic attacks and what are non-epileptic attacks. What's the difference? An epileptic attack uh, would be defined as a sudden involuntary change in behavior, movement, sensation, or consciousness, alertness, uh, along with an abnormal electrical pattern that is set off in the brain as seen by an EEG at the same time. So there is uh, not just a change on EEG, but there is also some observable change or at least a change in the patient's uh, uh, experience. A non-epileptic attack is an event that can look very similar to an epileptic attack, but it happens without the abnormal electrical changes that occur during the epileptic attack. And there are two major non-epileptic attacks. Uh, one would be physiological, bodily, non-epileptic seizures, and the other would be psychological or emotional non-epileptic seizures. They may also be called psychogenic. So these are the two main categories. And for physiological non-epileptic seizures, there is a long uh, list or possibilities of uh, disorders that could be physiological and that could produce something that looks like a seizure but is not epileptic. And your doctor would be taking a thorough history, not just to understand your symptoms, but also your other clinical uh, issues, and would then determine whether one of these in particular or others that are not on this list need to be ruled out. So for example, some of the typical physiologic non-epileptic uh, sources of a, of a seizure could be a syncope, the temporary loss of consciousness, also known as fainting or passing out, which is usually due to insufficient supply of oxygen to the brain. It could also be due to migraines that sometimes occur with um, either odd sensations or even um, uh, perceptions, uh, sleep disorders, low sugar, hypoglycemia, and a whole series of other medical conditions that, again, your physician would be uh, considering in the rule out diagnosis. Now the other large category of non-epileptic seizures would be psychogenic non-epileptic seizures or psychological. And these episodes are what we're going to be talking about tonight. So these episodes are triggered by psychological distress and further fueled by depression, anxiety, anger, difficulty reading emotions, and often a trauma history, although not always. So the question is sometimes, how can our mind be doing something that we don't know about or that we're not controlling? And in extreme conditions, psychology knows that the brain can activate and deactivate parts of itself. This is known as dissociation or splitting off of awareness, which is a feature that could happen in PNES. And during the episode, you may still be able to perform actions, but you may be unaware of what you're doing, or you may be unable to control certain, certain aspects of your
your behavior. So now that we've defined what PNES is, uh, the question is, what's the right way to call this disorder? And there's been a lot of uh, discussions and uh, back and forth as to how this disorder should be called. And that is important because the way that uh, the scientific community names uh, something uh, really helps uh, not just to understand it, to define it, but also affects the way that uh, the condition itself is perceived. Uh, so the uh, current uh, um, tendency is to call this psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, PNES. But there are other names that you may hear around uh, in different, uh, different uh, clinical settings, uh, including just psychogenic seizures, uh, pseudo-seizures, hysterical seizures, and non-epileptic attack disorder need uh, is something that is used in England. Particularly, pseudo-seizures uh, and hysterical seizures have now been abandoned by most clinicians uh, because they are uh, um, offensive to patients. Uh, pseudo, in particular, can be taken to mean fake or false. And histor hysterical seizures are also obviously being avoided for the same reason. They also uh, can affect the way that the uh, health professionals see the patient uh, because this uh, word pseudo uh, has a negative connotation. So at this point in the United States, uh, this disorder would be called PNES, and in England, NEAD. So what do PNESs look like? What do these episodes look like? And this is where the tricky part comes in, because they can look very much like any epileptic seizure. And they may change over time. So over, over the years, uh, you may have a uh, change in how your episodes present. And uh, they may become more complex. These can include shaking, either of a part of the body or the whole body, paralysis, inability to speak, groaning, clenching, and so forth. And they can look very much like a, an epileptic seizure. The duration can vary, although often non-epileptic seizures tend to be, uh, can be long and can actually even last uh, several hours. There may be auras, which are simply uh, warning signs prior to the full-blown episode. Uh, it could include either noticing that uh, Things look odd visually, uh, sounds are different, uh, or even uh, physical changes, uh, rapid heart rate, uh, tightness in the chest, and so forth. And these precede the actual full-blown episode. There can be all kinds of movements. Uh, like we said, there can be shaking, paralysis, uh, parts of the body that are shaking or that are numb, and uh, all the way to uh, there being absolutely no movement and rigidity. Uh, there can actually be injuries during uh, PNES, especially if there are falls um, or a loss of tone uh, during the episode. Uh, and there is often a sense of semi-consciousness. Um, many patients say that they can hear what is being said and they have a sense of what is going on, but they often don't have the ability to speak. And there can even be urinary incontinence uh, during uh, some of these episodes. So all of this can overlap with epileptic seizures. So how would you diagnose PNES? And clearly, by visual observation, uh, that would not be enough, um, because they can look a lot like epileptic seizures. Now, by history taking, again, you would not have enough information to make a diagnosis. There are a number of patients who have epilepsy who also have a traumatic history or who have psychiatric conditions that go along with epilepsy. So the fact that someone has an episode that looks a certain way or they have a certain history 
would be insufficient to make a definitive diagnosis of PNES. And the same would go for a routine EEG that is performed in an office. You might be missing the information that you need to make a definitive diagnosis. The gold standard at this point is uh, to use video EEG monitoring. And that is an electroencephalogram that is conducted uh, in the hospital with a video machine over a period of time. You'd also, when you are looking for a diagnosis, would want to be seen by a neurologist or even better, an epileptologist. Uh, these are doctors who are specialized in neurology and who have specialized in epilepsy. You might also be looking for board certifications, American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, American Board of Clinical Neuro Neurophysiology. And to find a doctor who is uh, listed in the American Epilepsy Society, there is a link that I list right here um, that uh, would be the place to go. And you can look for this doctor uh, based on, on your uh, location in the United States. You might also be looking for a, an epilepsy center that has a, a National Association of Epilepsy Centers level three or four. So what is an electroencephalogram, an EEG? It allows the doctor to monitor electrical activity in the patient's brain during epileptic events. An EEG has around 10 to 20 cables that are attached with special adhesives, a kind of glue, to the patient's scalp. And the electrical activity of the brain is monitored for a specific specified period of time. What is video EEG? Video EEG is EEG, and it has had added to it special cameras. Uh, and the length of the study is extended. The patient is connected to the traditional EEG machine, but in addition to this, he or she is placed in a hospital room that is equipped with cameras and that can observe the patient throughout the EEG monitoring. And it allows the doctors to look at both the brainwave data as well as the images on video of the patient's episode. And this is what allows them to make a proper diagnosis. So sometimes the question is, what if I don't have an episode while I'm in the hospital? And you'll see that doctors have some ways of uh, bringing about episodes, including withdrawal of anti-epileptic medications, hyperventilation, using stimulation with lights, and even sometimes through suggestion, uh, through uh, interviewing techniques, and uh, um, through other, other um, verbal or even sometimes uh, semi-physiological ways. So you may have to spend uh, longer than three to four days, which is the typical uh, length of, of stay, um, if you have not had an episode. But uh, typically, doctors will be trying to stress you in a certain way through all of these uh, techniques um, to see if, uh, if an episode can be produced. There are some limitations to video EEG monitoring. Some epileptic seizures are not easily detected on EEG. They may be occurring in a small and localized area of the brain, and they might not be picked up. So in order to increase the likelihood of detecting EEG abnormalities, the goal is to uh, obtain as, as many typical events as possible. When we talk about typical events, uh, the doctor will want to get a description from you. And if you're not able to provide it from your family members or anyone else who has witnessed your episode, to get as much detail as possible and to then uh, be able to observe that episode or those episodes um, with video and with EEG when you're in the hospital. So some of the questions that are sometimes asked is um, including characteristics about PNES. How many people have PNES? The prevalence of PNES cases is not known, although it's been reported that out of 10 new patients seen in epilepsy outpatient settings, that would be an outpatient clinic, for example, one out of 10 uh, might have PNES. And out of 10 patients in an inpatient epilepsy center, approximately three out of 10 might have PNES. This is a pretty high number, three out of 10, 30%. Um, the issue is that uh, patients who are being referred to an inpatient epilepsy center 
are very select. Um, and that is why we may be seeing higher numbers uh, in that setting. And the prevalence of psychogenic non-epileptic seizures uh, is somewhere between 2 to 33 per 100,000. Uh, this was reported by Bembedis and Hauser in 2000. How long does it take to diagnose and treat? Unfortunately, it takes on average seven and up to 16 years to correctly diagnose the condition. Prognosis is better the sooner treatment is started. And part of the reason that it does take uh, so long to diagnose is uh, partly the ping pong effect that we talked about before, and also uh, that there may not be uh, the necessary testing equipment uh, in order to, to diagnose the patient. The prognosis is better uh, as soon as uh, if uh, treatment is started, um, as soon as the diagnosis is made, and uh, if it is. Uh, the diagnosis is made uh, at an earlier time. Treatment, however, can take months to years, and some patients will continue to come to therapy or support groups uh, for a very long time. The question would be, who gets PNES, men or women? And it is much more common in women. Out of 10 individuals who develop PNES, six to seven are women. We are finding now that war veterans and elderly are growing in numbers, so there are a greater number of war veterans who are also being diagnosed with PNES. And the most common age to start is in adulthood, uh, anywhere from the 20s to 30s. Although there have been some case reports of very young children, as young as four years, who have been reported to have been diagnosed with PNES. The question is, can you have PNES and epilepsy? And there are a fair number of patients who have PNES and who also have epileptic attacks. And researchers have reported a wide range, anywhere between 4 to 50 percent of patients with PNES also have some form of epilepsy. And this, again, underscores the importance of video EEG. Uh, you do want to be able to diagnose if someone has PNES only or if someone has PNES and epilepsy the treatment would be dramatically different. Can you have PNES if you've had a head injury? Yes. Many patients with PNES report head injuries, and about a third have had a moderate head injury. Neurological findings are also not uncommon. Uh, just the recent uh, ongoing research that we did at our center found that about 40% of a small sample had an abnormality on imaging, either CAT scan or MRI. And it's not yet clear if there is a significant connection between head injuries and a positive neurohistory and PNES. But definitely it calls for future studies. And this is something that uh, we need to include in our uh, understanding and our studies of PNES. How common is it to have a family history of epilepsy? Some research suggests that three out of four, uh, I'm sorry, three to four out of 10 people with PNES report that someone in their family has epilepsy. So it's not that uncommon to have someone in the family who has epilepsy, and also many patients with PNES have witnessed seizures at some point in their lifetime. Now we're going to switch over to talking about some of the psychological characteristics of PNES. And we're starting with trauma and PTSD. Uh, reports of 70 to 90 percent of patients with PNES have a trauma history. And trauma can be anything from sexual to physical abuse, bullying, psychological abuse, major losses, for example, the death of a uh, very important figure, um, major illnesses, surgical procedures. Uh, sometimes patients have had multiple very painful surgical procedures, sometimes at a young age and also witnessing the abuse of another. The most common reported trauma is sexual or physical abuse, but we definitely do see some of the others. Now, those who have undergone trauma do not necessarily develop PTSD. And those who have PTSD and PNES 
are a smaller percentage, uh, anywhere from 25 to 58 percent, depending on the study and on the measures that were used. So the question we just answered, does everyone who has PNES have trauma or PTSD? No. Uh, and actually, around 25 percent of patients with PNES deny trauma. So that is uh, a pretty hefty percent of patients who deny trauma and who therefore obviously do not have PTSD either. Um, of the ones who've been traumatized, a small percentage goes on to develop PTSD. For those who have experienced trauma and who have developed PTSD, there are some very specific treatments that are available, which is a, a positive um, from, a, from a clinical perspective. And those who have no history of trauma and have PNES are still not well understood. Uh, it's not a large number of patients, um, but uh, it's, a, it's a significant group that are still unclear to uh, most in terms of what could have contributed to this disorder and uh, definitely uh, is another area that needs to be researched. Depression and PNES, uh, depression is very high. And again, there are percentages of patients with PNES who are also clinically depressed, ranging anywhere from 50% to the 90%. And depression typically precedes and also follows PNES. So there may very clearly be depression prior to even starting having the episode. But it also uh, does follow and may even worsen after PNES develops. And quality of life is connected to depression also. Now, important to keep in mind, again, that depression can be treated through psychotherapy and psychiatric medication. And quality of life in PNES, quality of life is uh, significantly worse even than in patients who have uh, medically intractable epilepsy. Uh, clearly, uh, quality of life is, uh, is very effective in PNES and uh, is uh, a troubling area both for patients and also for clinicians. Uh, we published an article last year on quality of life of PNES, and we found that uh, obviously uh, it had already been reported in other papers. Uh, PNES had worse quality of life than, um, than uh, epileptic patients and uh, uh, also had anger management problems, pain syndromes, and were older when the PNES started. So quality of life was worse in those who were depressed and had these other issues of anger and pain syndrome. Anxiety in PNES, anxiety is clearly also very elevated in patients who have uh, this disorder. Uh, typically reports are around 50%, but they can be higher or lower. And what we have found is that uh, anxiety um, relates to uh, also how you cope with your stress and what sort of strategies you use. And we did uh, publish a paper this year on problematic stress coping strategies. Um, and we found that around uh, that over 30 percent of a PNES sample was using ineffective stress coping strategies, and only one fourth was using the more effective stress coping strategy. So clearly, the more ineffective uh, you are being in uh, facing and, and dealing with your stress, uh, the more your anxiety can, uh, can rise. Important, again, is to realize that anxiety can be treated through psychotherapy and through psychiatric medication. Anger and PNES. This is an issue that uh, we've been looking at now for several years. And what we find is uh, clearly anger is a fuel. And what can happen in many patients with PNES is that there's a lack of assertiveness. Assertiveness would be to be um, not angry, not an angry or aggressive person, but a person who is able to stand up for herself or himself that limits and uh, make sure that uh, either your feelings are heard, your desires are heard, and that uh, you are not um, steamrolled uh, by others. But the lack of assertiveness comes up, feeling of being steamrolled, of not being able to 
uh, have yourself heard or of ending up doing things that you don't really want to do. The other part of this is that the pressure may build up and at some point you may have angry outbursts that emerge when it's not appropriate. Now it's important to keep in mind that, again, anger can be treated through anger management and there are assertiveness training techniques that your therapist can provide you. Another characteristic, psychological characteristic that we see in PNES is something called alexithymia. It could also be called emotional blindness. And it's essentially that you are not always 100% sure what you're feeling. And so you may have physical reactions and uh, you may have a sense that something is going on, but you're not um, reading your emotions clearly and you're not being able to name them clearly and to act upon them. And what we found in 2013, we published an article in which uh, over a third of the PNES sample uh, was falling within the alexithymic range. And those with alexithymia also scored high on PTSD symptoms and on a measure of cynicism slash uh, depression. Now that we've talked about the psychological characteristics, some of the psychological characteristics that have been pinpointed in PNES, uh, we can talk about mental functions. And Basically, most of the neuropsychological testing of PNES has shown that uh, there is a, a normal intelligence um, in, in this population. Uh, what we also find is that there are a number of complaints about cognitive functioning, uh, specifically uh, memory, memory problems, attention problems, sometimes language uh, problems. And uh, this is not only reported by patients, but when we do standardized testing, we have been finding that uh, there is clearly an indication that cognitive functioning is not um, within normal limits for many patients. So in 2012, we uh, presented a poster at the American Epilepsy Society in which we found that 18 to 23 percent of patients with PNES uh, were scoring abnormally on executive function subtests. And executive function functioning would be uh, specifically attention, concentration, ability to shift tasks efficiently. As for memory, there are significant self-reports of memory problems in patients. Uh, this is a common complaint. And we have seen that as well on testing. And more specifically, this year, we will be presenting a poster in which we looked at patients who had PNES and PTSD. And they were found to have some very significant impairments in verbal memory. Uh, in addition, Marcus Ruber, uh, who is a uh, PNES, uh, PNES expert um, located out of England, uh, published in 2002 a study of PNES patients, and they had looked at them on a series of cognitive tests, and they found that 60.6% .6 of their patients performed below the norm on at least one testing domain. So clearly there are neuropsychological problems that we're seeing in uh, patients with PNES. And uh, although we're confirming this, and although patients already knew this, uh, this is a, a, another uh, path for research to better understand what is happening with these patients. Now, we do use certain psychometric tools. And this is, I know this is a, uh, a webinar for uh, patients and loved ones, but I'll just mention that uh, we use a, a total of six uh, emotional um, inventories in our battery at the Northeast Regional Epilepsy Group. And specifically, we're looking at quality of life, alexithymia, depression, anger, anger expression and anger control, stress coping strategies, and trauma symptoms. So if you fill out these questionnaires, this is what you're being uh, evaluated on. In addition to that, we administer uh, cognitive testing, uh, but that, that is another piece. So now that we've talked about how do you diagnose, what are the characteristics, and so forth, and we've just touched upon uh, just some basics about PNES, um, let's move on to treatment. 
and treatment of PNES, the first step uh, may seem somewhat simple and, and, and uh, superficial, but the conversation that the patient has with his or her neurologist or psychologist or psychiatrist before being discharged from the hospital is key. If the explanation and the diagnosis has been presented in a thorough, in a clear, in an understanding way, um, including what is PNES, what do we know about its origins, how does it fit in with your history, how does it make sense, and how it can be treated, uh, these, this is uh, a key part of uh, a patient being able to move towards uh, treatment and towards recovery. So ideally, the patient would not leave the hospital without a psychological referral in hand. So even if there is no PNES program at the center, uh, there should be a referral that has been made uh, so that the patient knows where to go once they leave the hospital. And next, the most successful psychological and psychiatric interventions are those that are integrated within the epilepsy center. So in other words, the psychologist or the psychiatrist would be part of the epilepsy center, part of the team. And in this way, the patient continues to be treated by uh, professionals who, first off, know what this disorder is, who are colleagues of the patient's epilepsy specialist, who are part of the team, and who will be involved in any medication or treatment changes that take place. Now, the next best thing would be, even if this uh, professional is not part of the hospital team, uh, that uh, this would be someone who is in close contact with the team, who understands what PNES is, and who would be able to communicate back and forth if needed. And until recently, there really has been no treatment that's been designed specifically for PNES. There are some recent studies that show encouraging results in PNES treatment using cognitive behavioral therapy, also known as CBT. And CBT, just in a nutshell, is a type of treatment that focuses on your thoughts and behaviors and how those together fuel psychological problems and social difficulties. So the theory is how you think of and how you interpret an event will affect the way you feel and behave. So the more aware you become of your thoughts and the more you realize that some of them are actually not even all that realistic or logical, uh, allows you to then move towards change. And therapy is uh, pretty intense and it involves charting, homework assignments, learning relaxation techniques, and education you know, in a variety of other ways. Now there are other available treatments, including psychodynamic, uh, psychoanalytic treatment, family therapy, trauma-specific treatments, which we'll talk about now, uh, in the next few slides, mindfulness and positive psychology. And there are a series of other theories uh, in psychology that are also uh, provided um, to, to different patients. The elimination of seizures or significant reduction in numbers has been reported in about a fourth to over half of the cases using any of the above mentioned techniques. So anywhere from a fourth to half of the cases have either had a total elimination of seizures or a significant reduction. Now, if we're talking about PTSD and PNES, there are some very specific treatments that are designed to treat PTSD. So rather than using a general treatment, you would now be using something that is much more targeted. And one of the most scientifically proven treatments for PTSD is called prolonged exposure therapy, also known as PE. The PE theory is pretty simple and basic. It is that extreme trauma teaches the survivor that in order to remain safe, many dangers in life need to be avoided. So you have been traumatized by something, and you learn that you need to avoid certain things that remind you of or that uh, somehow are related to what, you, um, to what you experienced. The problem is that avoidance becomes a big part of the survivor's life, and the list of things that you avoid can grow over time. 
of PNES itself, the episodes, uh, can sometimes be seen very clearly as being uh, an avoidance uh, technique. And this is avoidance not from a conscious uh, perspective. This is a way of uh, either self-preservation or uh, helping yourself in a situation that is overwhelming. Now, the treatment in P is to do the exact opposite. So you stop avoiding and you start confronting that which is feared. And the treatment lasts uh, around 15 sessions. There's a lot of education. And there are two things that are called in vivo and imaginal exposure. And this is basically uh, in vivo exposure is you are um, finding uh, things in your life, situations in your life that you have been avoiding as a result of the trauma and the PTSD. And you very gradually, and with your therapist's help, uh, work towards being able to confront and to experience those uh, situations. Imaginal exposure is uh, done in the office uh, initially, where you are remembering the trauma and you are uh, revisiting it and staying with it. So um, basically, just recapping, we talked about treatment uh, and uh, that there has there have been a few studies already done on uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for PNES. There's also uh, uh, prolonged exposure therapy for those who have PNES and PTSD. But in, in summarizing uh, my sense after working for a number of years with PNES is that one size typically does not fit all. So uh, although some of these treatments may seem uh, very, very efficient uh, for some patients, they may not necessarily be efficient for everyone. And basically, uh, the starting point is to really understand each individual patient. Uh, this is the reason that we uh, administer this long battery of tests. Uh, we're trying to take apart and to understand where the problems are. What are the targets that we're going to need to uh, look at in treatment? And based on that, the treatment is tailored um, to uh, look at those target points um, from what we've understood from the testing. And with regards to PTSD, uh, if the patient is studied carefully and if PTSD is diagnosed, uh, then there are clearly scientifically supported treatments that should be implemented first. Uh, and then if uh, symptoms persist, then uh, a different kind of treatment could be used. I would say in, in, uh, in some, uh, the importance is that the therapist is flexible, that the therapist is thorough in understanding the patient, but is then flexible to administer the type of treatment that is appropriate uh, and makes sense with that particular patient. One other thing, uh, when uh, patients have been in therapy with me, and, and some of you may be listening today who have uh, been in therapy with me and have uh, heard this uh, speech, uh, I, I'm quite convinced that uh, we are not just uh, a mind or just a body. And so uh, in therapy itself, uh, we'll often encourage and go over this uh, physical exercise is something that is very important to incorporate in, in anyone's life. Obviously, um, making sure that this is safe, checking with your doctor, and making sure that this is the type of exercise you can perform. A healthy diet is essential uh, to have uh, a healthy mood. Uh, proper sleep, and this can sometimes be a major problem for patients with PNES. So the importance of sleeping well, of sleep hygiene, and if needed, of uh, further testing to see if there is a, an additional sleep disorder. Quality time set aside for yourself is very important as well. And uh, sometimes there are wellness programs offered at different centers. Uh, and if there are, then make use of them. Wellness typically includes, uh, for example, yoga or uh, another kind of, uh, of exercise, 
or um, mindfulness, uh, breathing, and so forth. So there, we're almost closing now. We're going to talk about future directions in treatment. And like I mentioned, there have been uh, there has been research into uh, CBT, and it is underway uh, at a few centers already. Um, the numbers are still small, uh, but they are looking encouraging. Uh, at the Northeast Regional Epilepsy Group, we're providing uh, prolonged exposure for patients diagnosed with PNES and PTSD. We're in the initial phases, but we are uh, also um, looking at this and, uh, and tracking to see uh, what effectiveness this has. Group treatments are being provided at some centers. And again, the question is, uh, how effective are they? And uh, I have run some group treatments myself, and uh, they, they can have some very positive effects, um, including that you are in a, in a setting with other people who are diagnosed with the same condition, and there's an understanding that is different than when you're simply talking to a therapist. Things that still need to be studied, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, EMDR, um, is, it, is it also uh, effective with PNES and uh, trauma? Complementary and alternative treatments, uh, specifically things such as yoga, um, uh, some massage therapies and, and so forth. Uh, although there is no, no evidence that these are useful or effective, uh, there are some patients who are trying them, uh, are finding that they do help to bring down stress. So again, this is something that we should be looking at as uh, researchers. Neurological underpinnings, like I mentioned, uh, we do see a number of patients who've had head injuries or who have uh, findings on imaging studies. Uh, so again, this is something that uh, is in the future uh, to continue looking at. And physiological underpinnings, we are seeing patients who have uh, some physical um, issues, for example, extreme allergies, uh, high sensitivity to medications, um, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. And again, I don't think it's clearly understood how this ties in with PNES, but we are seeing that there are a number of patients who have this and uh, from a research perspective, need to continue looking at that. Education, this is really part of the reason why we did this webinar. Uh, it is essential that uh, patients are educated, that their family members are educated, and that the professionals who work with them are educated. So we have uh, put together this webinar for that purpose. We also have an upcoming release of a book that is called, it's actually called Psychogenic Non-Epileptic Seizures, A Guide. This is a book that is not meant to replace therapy, but is meant to educate on what PNES is. It goes into much more depth than what we did in this webinar, and also provides some relaxation techniques and some other methods that you would be using in some therapies and that give you a flavor of what that would be like. We've been busy publishing articles locally and nationwide in psychology journals. Uh, this is uh, meant to educate and to reach uh, psychologists and other mental health professionals. We've been busy publishing articles uh, nationwide and internationally in epilepsy journals, again, about PNES and what we are understanding. We do have a, a, a blog, or actually I have a blog. We have a website. And we also have a Facebook page that are all on non-epileptic seizures. And something that we have been uh, thinking about and that I discussed uh, not that long ago with um, a very active epilepsy advocate called um, John, uh, and who actually wrote a book uh, from his perspective as the husband of someone who has PNES. The book is called Lowering the Shield. Uh, something that we were talking about uh, a few weeks ago was uh, whether it would at some point be possible to set up a fund to support persons with PNES, either to support their education, research, or potentially treatment. So this is something that is uh, somewhat of a dream, 
but uh, we have it floating around there and we're thinking about it. I've got some patient resources that I'm listing here. Uh, our website, sonepileptipseizures.com, blog, Facebook, the LinkedIn group, and there are treatment sites uh, listed at the bottom. There are not too many treatment sites, unfortunately, on this uh, page, uh, but these are some of the sites that uh, I have spoken to directly and that um, I, I feel that I can recommend. Professional resources, if there are any professionals listening, although this is for patients and loved ones, um, there is the Gates and Rowan's Non-Epileptic Seizures book from 2010. Uh, Marcus Ruber uh, has published uh, many articles on PNES. I would say uh, one of the most comprehensive and most interesting ones uh, from recent years is uh, from 2008 called Psychogenic Non-Epileptic Seizures, Answers and Questions. We've also been busy publishing articles on alexithymia, quality of life, trauma, and PTSD, and stress coping strategies. And I thank you very much for attending this webinar. Feel free to share with others. And uh, just stay tuned, because we may be uh, putting together another webinar, either for patients and loved ones or for professionals.